Hey everybody, welcome back. At the Microhams Digital Conference in March of 2015, we heard an interesting presentation by Brian Hoyer, K7UDR, that covers the history of telephone networks and data networks. He shows us how they developed and how they've come to merge. Consider our smartphones today. We've got a telephone, we've got the internet, messaging, everything all in one device on one network. In the first half of his presentation, Brian asks us to consider our own amateur radio hobby. With the new emerging technologies, we now are looking at modes such as D-Star, System Fusion, and DMR. Are we headed off in many different directions? Or will we someday see these things merge together where we can talk from one to the other? And in the second half, we get an update on what's going on at Northwest Digital Radio. For that reason, I've decided to split his presentation into two videos. This one will cover the telecoms and the netcoms. If you want to jump ahead to the update on the UDR project, click this box right here. Otherwise, join me now as we enter Building 37 on the Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington. And with that, Brian Hoyer. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk today about the great telecom netcom conversion, which happened a few <laughs> decades ago, or maybe it's still happening. Anybody recognize this quote? My master chief used to say that a lot. <laughs> Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. It's usually used in a historical content. You know, wars, the two-front war, don't go into Russia in the winter, all that kind of stuff. Anybody except me think this applies to technology as well? A couple of you. And yet I see this over and over again, is that we go out and we invent something new. We could have just looked over our shoulder and see what somebody else did or how someone else solved a similar problem. So here's the stump question. Who said this? Two of you got it. I thought it was like I thought it was like Napoleon or Churchill or somebody. George Santayana, in the book *The Life of Reason*, he was a uh, late 1800s, early 20th century philosopher and poet. Okay, in the beginning, there was the telephone. Old Alexander Graham Bell, back in oh 1876-ish. And the telephone was an analog device. It stayed an analog device between 1876 and up till about 1950. So we had this system. Subscribers were wired to a central office or exchange. Everybody who had a phone got a pair. We put power on the pair. You know why that was? If you look at the dates, the telephone precedes the general use of electricity in most of the world. When my mother was growing up, she had no phone and no power. And when she left the farm in Montana, she had a phone and no power. So that's the, one of the reasons why battery, which is on your phone line, powers your phone. Now, the subscribers are all wired to a central office or exchange. Everybody gets a pair. In the exchange, they have switches. We connect the switches to each other with trunks. And we apply the Erlang model to figure out how many of this we need, which is basically the thing that says, OK, if I got 100 people here and 100 people over there, we can handle traffic within the exchange. But we're only going to support 20 simultaneous connection between the exchanges. And the math for that was called the Erlang model. And it still applies to lots of things today. Even if you're talking about what happens when I stream Netflix at night at 6 PM <laughs> when everybody else does the same thing. That breaks the Erlang model. If you go through the math on this carefully, you will beg for broadcast. Because I'm downloading the film, and he's downloading it three minutes later. 
in about the 1950s, they realized that digging the ground up and putting more wires in the ground was expensive. So trunks actually went to frequency division multiplexing. So a common technique we use in RF to get more stuff over a given path is to FDM it. They were still analog, but it did increase the capacity. So now we've blown through 75 years of building out arguably the finest phone system in the world in analog. But in the 60s, things start to get crazy. Computers are happening, transistors are happening, integrated circuits are happening. There's lots of growth in the electronics industry. And one thing that happened out of that was the trunks were the first to go digital with what's called the T carrier. There's argument about what T stands for. Some folks think it's trunk, some think it's terrestrial. The official book doesn't say. And here is where we first went digital in any part of the telephone system. Starting at the bottom with a subscriber, we have what we call a DS0, a digital subscriber line. And they settled on eight samples at eight kilohertz, companded. Remember mu law and a law? A way to use the eight bits better. Not compressed, but companded. And that gave us a raw data rate of 64 kilobits per second. That's still in use today. Who remembers ISDN? How many people actually had ISDN? Okay, I had it in my office in Saratoga, California. I had one of the first websites. I ran my own server. People would come to my office and go, wow, I have never seen the internet this fast. I could have more than one window open at the same time. It was incredible. 128 kilobits. What happened since then, who knows? But if you think about it, ISDN was a logical extension. I just gave you two phone lines and then bridged them, and now you get 128K, and that should be plenty for anybody for anything, and you'll never need more than 640K of memory. At this point, it's kind of interesting to go think of how they did this. This is done with synchronous TDM. That's not TDMA, it's time division multiplexing. And in fact, Brian Heaton's not here, but I think last time I was talking about it, he said all of the, there's only three clocks in the US for the entire phone system. So what you're doing now is you have a fully synchronous system, and then you have time slots. Notice if we all know what the time is, and we're all off exactly the same clock, and we clock forward and it's fully synchronous, there's almost no overhead. And a quick calculation will show how little overhead is required in this. So the venerable T1 line, 64 kilobits per line, 24 subscriber lines, one bit of frame sync between the 24 channels, add it all up, 1.544 megabits per second. So 24 voice grade lines with virtually no overhead. That's a fantastic way you know, low latency, no jitter, we're all on the same clock. This is a fantastic way to build a high-grade voice system. Now, of course, you can take T1 and keep playing the go faster and add more game. You get a T3 or a DS3, or you can put it over fiber and call it an OC3, OC192. You can keep building this up forever. But wait, there's more. Over on the computer side of the world, back in 1970, the Aloha Net. Who remembers the Aloha Net? I read, read about it. Okay, Aloha Net. Back in the 70s, islands in Hawaii, they're tossing packets back and forth over radio. And a guy named Bob Metcalf, in about 1973, read the paper on the Aloha Net. He was at Xerox Park, and they started building the first Ethernet system. And it was based on many of the principles of Aloha Net. Carrier sense, multiple access, collision detection. We'll throw our stuff in the air. We'll listen. We'll figure out what doesn't make it. Maybe add some air checking, not air correction. Maybe do a retry. And they start to build this kind of floppy network thing in the sky in the Hawaiian Islands. By 1979, Bob Metcalf had left Xerox Park 
and it started 3Com. Who remembers 3Com? Who worked there? Who worked there? No, no, you worked at a company that got bought by them. Oh. <laughs> Basil was at 3Com with Bob Metcalf, our software guy, and some other interesting characters. So by 1973, it was three megabits experimental at Xerox Park. Ten years later, we're up to 10 megabits. What's Xerox Park? You kept saying that word. <laughs> Park? What's Xerox Park? Palo Alto Research Center. So, so Xerox, of copy machine fame, made a lot of money. And they did a familiar thing. They said, we have a lot of money. Maybe we should have a research division. Kind of like Alexander Graham Bell had Bell Labs. It's, it's the kind of thing you do. When you make a whole bunch of money, you do two things. One, you build a big fancy campus. And then you decide you should have a research group. Later, Wall Street will make you tear those both down, but that's a different problem. <laughs> so now we're up at 1983, and we've got 10 megabits per second. We're still over big fat cables that you have to wind around, and it looks like a network, but we have you know BNCs and coax connectors, and it, it looks like RF networking. It took another seven years to get to the implementation which we're familiar with now back in 1990, which is 10 base T. And the big thing, Jeremy and I were just talking about this, all of these advances, you have to look at two factors, speed and economics. We always want the fastest, most reliable, most economical network. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So now we get down to, let's not use this coax. It's bulky, it's hard to bend. It's expensive to terminate. You have to know what you're doing. Let's use, let's, in fact, let's steal other phone company technology and get RJ45s and unshielded twisted pair, UTP. Let's use phone wire. This is where the convergence starts to happen. Phone guys are over here, network guys are over here, and they're, and they're looking over, the, over their shoulder and going like, we should use the cheap stuff they use because then any monkey could install this. So that comes into place in about 1990. So I'm perfectly happy. I have a phone, super reliable in my office. I have a network for my computer. Everything is fine. Why would I even bother to tie these two things together? Well, 1980, IBM PC shows up, and computers start to show up in the home. And at first, they're mostly, oh, I can do some work at home, carry a floppy around. But that's when it starts to happen. Next thing you know, your kids are playing games on them. Apple II shows up. The personal computer, you know, not the Vax, not the one that you terminaled into, but the actual personal computer starts to become a home fixture. That's the 1980s. We get over to about, what is it, about 1992 when the World Wide Web shows up? Now, I skipped the internet for a reason, because the internet was still a business-level curiosity. It went from businesses to businesses, government research centers to other government research centers. Universities were involved. When Bill and Dave, Hewlett and Packard, when they left Stanford, they took that networking with them. So it was a big boy's toy, this internet thing. But when the World Wide Web comes on, a drastic change happens. Because although most of us can SSH into a Raspberry Pi and perform complicated scripts and compiles on it, that's not for your average person. So what the web does is it adds accessibility. Now I've got this PC sitting there, and all of a sudden, I'm no longer satisfied with using Procom Plus to go into a BBS. Although when I first did that, it was fantastic, because I was laying out PC boards, and instead of driving with a floppy to the film house to make the film for my boards, I could modem the Gerber files to the fab house, and they'd just build my boards. That was fantastic. What a great time saver that was. 
So this is all happening. But as it becomes more and more commonplace, it's not just for business anymore. We've now got home applications. People are starting to play with email and stuff. So why build two totally separate networks to do the same thing? Economics always wins. So the question becomes, now that we've built out the phone system using TDM, high quality, hard allocation, we've got the network system, we're pouncing these packets around, speeds are starting to get up, who's going to win? Exactly, the cheapest one wins. So if we look at the telephony system, which as I said earlier, it's a fantastic way to build a high quality digital voice network. It's got a couple problems. That synchronization, clock forwarding, is problematic from an engineering standpoint. It requires very high accuracy, very low latency, a lot of mechanisms and phase lock loop to do it. You look at networking clocking, oh, we'll just throw an inner frame delay in there, and then by the time that's gone, you'll catch the next one. So it's asynchronous. So what happens now in this period is there's starting to be a little bit of a battle going on. And it's really a business battle. It's not just about what's a better technology. It's about, it's about money. So now you're starting to see things like uh, ATM, asynchronous transfer mode. The phone guys are trying to do some packet-like stuff over their network. In the meantime, the network guys are trying to get you know, UDP and some more real-time protocols to get better voice quality over it. So now you've got these two problems. But here's the biggest one. It's all about economics. In the phone system, it's a hard allocated network. When I get my 64 kilobit link and you get yours, if I only use half of mine, the other half's gone. Multiply that out across everyone in this room. Most of our links are not being utilized, and I can't use somebody else's link. What's the solution? Make one bigger pipe, and then just let the stuff flow, and we'll pick it up on the other end. Is it perfect? No. It is not the way to deliver perfect voice grade, low latency systems. But as the speeds get higher, it gets good enough. And so the economics starts to play. So as Jerry and I were talking earlier, it's not really a question of did they converge? It's a question of who won. Now, I live on San Juan Island, just north of here. And as you probably know, oh, about a year and a half ago, we got our phone cable cut. We lost every phone in the county. Oh, except for the county phones themselves, because they were voice over IP over a network link. So they stayed up. And then we did all these machinations and lash ups trying to get our connectivity back, which were mostly microwave links. And here's a problem. People wanted their phone and internet back, but they're carried over two different networks using two different protocols. Now, you can put data over the phone network, and you can put voice over the data network. But if you try to go back and forth, it costs on both ends. So it's not an economical way to do that. To make interesting politics more interesting, there was a motion to get Opalco, our local power company cooperative, to use their mainland fiber to give broadband to the internet. And the good people of San Juan County quickly killed that idea because we don't need no stinking broadband. And then six months later, after I cut the cable, they decided they did need it. And now we're getting it because people's viewpoint of Oh, I didn't realize that when the phone lines went down, merchants couldn't swipe credit cards. <coughs> Our hospital was on fiber, but they depended on analog fax machines for prescriptions. People would come to the hospital, they'd get a test done, and they'd say, hey, go call Swedish Hospital for your results. They'd go, but we don't have any phones. Cell phones are down. Why? They link back into the same PSTN. So, the, the effect of that was all of us in the islands got an education for what a house of cards this system was. And today, now that we're getting fiber, I'm getting fiber to my house, 
I predict you'll see CenturyLink, the much ballyhooed, far away phone company. And I'm not going to pick on them because they're just a big phone company and they're not really any better or worse than any other big phone company or, or any internet provider for that matter. Because they're, they're just big entities that have their own needs. But the bottom line is that we need to get this fixed in some rational way. About that cell phone. It's like deja vu all over again. So cell phones come out. I had one of the early ones. I had the Motorola about the size of a shoe. Man, that was a great phone. I paid $700 for it. But as a consultant, I could go into a client's place, always bring the little charger because the battery doesn't last very long. But I could work someplace else and I could answer my phone. That was fantastic technology. Then what happened? Well, we went from analog voice, we went to digital voice. Ooh, we got all the digital advantages. And all that things happened, and there were some wrinkles around the way. And there's always somebody who goes, I like the analog one better. Just like there's guys who go, you know, those vinyl records are much better than CDs. And I can hear the compression in MP3. All, those people always exist. And, and it's not that they're wrong, it's just that they're a segment of society a little, little different value than most of us. Most of us work off of economics. So at this point, that's a little, quick little history review. I know most of you know all this stuff, which brings me to a story. So I'm working at HP Labs back in 1980, and I got this friend, and he's a scientist, got his degree, his master's in engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And he told me this story about a job interview he had in Texas. He goes down there and a the guy asks him, well, tell me about your master's thesis. And he describes this glorious project, which is all based on plasma physics. He's talking about things like the bi lengths and all this stuff. So, some of you know what I'm talking about. I don't, I'm just mimicking the words. And he gets all done and the interviewer says to him, I just got one question. What in the hell does that got to do with electrical engineering? And the reason he said that is because it doesn't. So why am I talking about this at an amateur radio conference? To DV or not to DV, that is the question. Whether it is noble to the mind to chop our precious spectrum into little tiny voice channels or to take arms against a sea of incompatible modes and build real data networks. My apologies to Mr. Shakespeare. Now this morning we had some talks. Kenny led off with kit building is good. Everyone should build a kit. I've built kits. I like that. We had a great talk about DMR, another way to do digital voice. It was all good. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, and I am not anti-DV. We sell products that help DV work, D-Star, Codex, all that stuff. But I think as a group, and this goes back to the ARETF, we shouldn't just take our spectrum and say, amateur radio is about voice. So let's chop it up into as many little hard allocated voice channels as possible so that we can never do any real networking. Because the history says that's not where we're going to end up. <coughs> but if we know that, we need to start now, <coughs> not later, to work towards it. Which is why Kenny brought up the ARETF which is kind of laying dormant because we don't quite have the energy and mass to it yet. But that's going to become significant in the future as we talk about how to accomplish these things and not end up with these fiefdoms of I'm a Yesu guy or I'm a DMR guy or I'm a whatever the next thing is guy. It's all about communication. Imagine if you got on the internet and you went to a website and the page said, I'm sorry, we've detected you're using a Juniper router. This is Cisco territory. <laughs> but better yet, I pick the phone up, I dial a number. Dee -doo -dee -dee. I'm sorry, you're talking to an incompatible modem. What's, what's with that? We wouldn't tolerate that anyplace else. I don't know why we're so eager to invite it into amateur. Thank you very much.